So today what we have is Saladin and the Third Crusade. The first episode is called Horns of Hatton. So I don't really know too much about the Crusades in general. I took one class on the Middle Ages where I learned a little bit about the Crusades, but I'm not very good at telling them apart. And generally, I don't remember most things that I learn. <laughs> I remember a small fraction of the things I learned that I find interesting, and that was not uh, uh, the the type of class where I'm more inclined to learn. I was not <laughs> really into the Middle Ages, though I am uh, prepared to learn now and a little bit more enthusiastic than I once was about the subject. I think learning about the Third Crusade could be a lot of fun. The First Crusade was a mess. Uh, the series was fun, uh, but yeah, it was a mess and in some ways a little bit depressing, but that's what history is. A mess and in some ways a little bit depressing, but interesting. So here we have Saladin, who I don't know about, and the Third Crusade. I don't know. Is this one of the successful Crusades? I feel like so, even... Even uh, successful is like a strong word in some cases, but like, is this considered one of like the ones where the Catholics did a good job at what they set out to do? Because I, I don't feel very good about it going into it. I, ge I guess we'll get started and see where it takes us. Sepharis, July 2nd, 1187. The armies of the Crusader states march to war. Leading them are three nobles of the Christian kingdoms of the Middle East founded during the First Crusade. Guy de Lucien, King of Jerusalem, Raymond III, Count of Tripoli, and the Grand Master of the Knights Templar. Before them, they carry the true cross, a piece of wood from the crucifix Christ died on, secured oh my in a silver box. And oh my god, they're actually doing that. Okay, that's fine. It's a joke that people make. That and I've I've mentioned this so many times, so it feels kind of cliche to go in but they say that there are so many pieces of the cross that christ died on so many people have a piece that if you put them all together you could build noah's ark so uh it's very likely that this uh is just a piece of wood piece of wood from the crucifix christ died on secured in an ornate silver box and they're on a rescue mission to relieve the besieged city of tiberius but they are not allies. In fact, until a few days ago, these men were divided over a bitter succession crisis. However, now they've put that aside to face a threat so great, no one kingdom can face Saladin. it. Saladin. The man who united the Muslim Middle East against them, Saladin. And they don't know it yet, but they're marching right into a trap. A trap at the horns of Hattin. The man who would unite the Islamic Middle East and battle the Crusader states was born into Crete in 1137. His personal name was Yusuf, with the honorific Salahadin, meaning the righteous of the faith, a name Westerners would contract to Saladin, which we'll be using for this series for simplicity. But whatever you call him, young Easy Saladin enough. was born into a world politically defined by the Crusades. Now, if you've watched our series on the First Crusade, you might wonder how I that did. uncoordinated trash fire managed to be so successful. The answer is weakness. By happenstance, the First Crusade managed to strike the Islamic Middle East at a time of fragmentation and infighting. When the Turkish Seljuk Empire was losing control over satellite states and breaking into trading provinces that were <laughs> unable to coordinate the response. After all, why let a united Muslim front get in the way of a good crusade? Sorry, sorry, had to do it once. In that vacuum, the invading Franks were able to carve out a series of crusader states, which became new wildcard players in Middle Eastern politics. By the time Saladin became a young adult, there were three main kingdoms, the County of Tripoli, the Principality of Antioch, and the Kingdom of Jerusalem. A fourth had fallen to the Turks, sparking a second crusade that failed to capture Damascus. Mm. Saladin's family were Sunni Muslims of Kurdish origin and served as soldiers and politicians under a family allied to the Seljuk Turks. Growing up with a classical Islamic religious education and frequent games of polo to train him as a cavalryman, he would actually receive most of his useful tutelage under his uncle, who trained him as a soldier and commander. Now, we could probably do a whole series on Saladin's early life and battles, but for the sake of brevity, let's just say this. 
the first four decades. Most episodes of Extra History could probably be expanded into an entire series in itself. So, like, I think that applies there, but I'm sure this guy is especially interesting. Decades of Saladin's life found him fighting other Muslims far more than the Crusader states. And this is because Saladin and his uncle served under Nur ad-Din, the ruler of the Seljuk Empire's Syrian province. And while Nur ad-Din's leadership was a critical factor in defeating the Second Crusade, he devoted much of his life to consolidating Muslim power in the Middle East, trying to unite the disparate Muslim provinces behind a jihad or holy war, declaring a crusade against the Crusaders. Of course, political, oh. religious, and ethnic divisions stood in the way of unity, but Nur ad-Din believed the only way to defeat the Crusader states and reclaim their territory, especially the holy city of Jerusalem, was to create an allied force among the Muslim states. As part of that effort, Saladin and his uncle took control of Egypt, which had been a Shia kingdom prior. Then when his uncle died, the young Saladin took over as vizier of Egypt, where the charismatic soldier showed great talent for leadership particularly in attracting talent through generosity, until he was declared sultan by his patron, the Abbasid Caliph in Baghdad. Saladin also began putting his- I wish I was better at explaining the difference between the Sunni and Shia, uh, but I'm so bad at articulating that stuff. I always just consider it like, they have different interpretations and generally don't like each other, but I find that the more I learn about the history of the Islamic world, I feel like it, the uh, differences between the two are often blown out of proportion, and the conflicts between the two are blown out of proportion in some areas. Sometimes there was more live and let live than uh, uh, we often believe now. <laughs> Uh, that wasn't always the case. They, there were plenty of conflicts, but it's not necessarily uh, a universal uh, violent conflict. It, it, it's really interesting. It's something I'd like to get a little bit more into, but I, I like that I'm starting to get uh, more layers of the Islamic world. I, I've actually found uh, some interesting creators who focus a little bit more on the history of the Islamic world, which I want to get further into because I feel like I'm just, my understanding of it is so shallow and it's one of the most interesting uh, regions of the world. So there's so much to go off of. And uh, Islam in general is just a really fun, uh, 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 a really fun religion to learn about in some ways his brothers and sons in high-ranking positions, building his family into what would be the Ayyubid dynasty. And when Nur ad-Din died, Saladin took on his mission to unite the powers of Islam against the Crusader states via force when necessary. By 1186, he'd been named the Sultan of both Egypt and Syria, skirmished with the secret of assassins, and had become famous for largely fighting other Assassina! Muslims. He mounted a propaganda <laughs> campaign, arguing that his conquest was necessary to defeat the infidels, but critics pointed out that when he did battle the Crusaders, he didn't always win. Eventually, though, he finally had sufficient force to confront the Crusader states. And it just so happened to be a good time to attack, because the most powerful of the Crusader states, the Kingdom of Jerusalem, was in a succession crisis. King Baldwin VI, a teenager with King leprosy, Baldwin. had come to the throne in 1174, oh, leprosy. unable to have children, and expected to die. At in, in a lot of cultures, um, uh, having sort of like, ha having these like physical defects or illnesses could disqualify you from becoming uh, uh, a leader in a lot of ways, which I, I'm... I'm actually curious about this. Some people would have illnesses and they would just keep them under wraps and uh, they they were able to slip by or whatever. But uh, leprosy, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that somebody with leprosy would be able to rule, especially at such a young age. I feel like somebody would take advantage. At any time, hey, Baldwin Hybrid was Punk, surrounded to have you by back. plots throughout his 11-year reign with Raymond III, Guy de Lusignan, his sister Sibylla, and a freebooting noble... I know absolutely nothing about South Dakota in history. It's one of the places that nobody in the United States really knows all that much about. Okay, maybe that's overstating. I'm sure there's really interesting stuff. I, I feel like there was some interesting uh, Native American history to learn about there, but I, 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 wish, I, I wish I could tell you. wish I had the fun facts, but I'm not the fun fact machine on that subject.
noble named Reynold of Chatillon, among the chief plotters. When Baldwin died, followed by Sibylla's son that he'd named as his heir, who also had leprosy, by the way, the nobles nearly came to blows. So to keep the crown away from Guy, Sibylla became the compromise candidate. But then upon her coronation, she shocked the court by marrying Guy, thus putting him on the throne. An event so divisive, Raymond temporarily oh, no. allied himself with Saladin against the kingdom of Jerusalem. Which just goes to show that politics often played as- It's a conspiracy! It's a conspiracy, I tell you! As much a role as religion during these conflicts. Meanwhile, Reynold of Shadion, a man who acted more like a pirate than an ideal- The Ottoman Empire was rather tolerant towards Shia- uh, before its conflict with Persia. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. Like, I thought it was like, like a heated problem the entire time, but there are eras of, uh, of calm, which that's something that I don't get with like the current portrayal of the Islamic world in like the media and whatever. You often get a, uh, a pretty lopsided understanding of it, but I've started to learn that it's a little bit more complicated than that. And it always is. It's always a little bit more complicated than that. So it's definitely something worth getting into. I, like I said, I have some Islamic creators that I want to get further into and I might do so on stream. I think that could be fun. Uh, maybe we could all watch somebody explain the difference between Sunni and Shia. So I don't have to. Uh, because, like I said, I don't feel qualified to explain such things. The image of a knight was provoking Saladin. He began raiding Muslim trade routes on the Red Sea, striking close to Mecca and Medina. But it was his plundering of a pilgrim caravan headed to Mecca in 1186 that made Reynold one of the most hated men in the Muslim Middle East. In retaliation, Saladin sprung his trap. He besieged the fortress of Tiberias, knowing that the Crusaders would be forced to attempt a rescue. And they did. The rivals put their squabbles aside and formed an alliance to crush Saladin. Though really, even then they <laughs> argued. Raymond insisted it was a trap that Tiberius, which was his fort commanded by his wife, should be sacrificed. But the others oh. called him a coward, so they marched. You coward! July 3rd, 1187. Oh, it is so hot. The crusader forces, weighed down by armor, trudge toward Tiberius. Saladin, they find, has filled the wells along their route, and mounted archers keep ambushing them with volleys of arrows before slipping away. The plan had been to march to Tiberias in a day, but wounded men are slowing them down, so they decide to stop at a spring for the night. But Saladin got there first. Instead of attacking, however, the exhausted Crusader army stakes camp. Then, Saladin's troops surround the Crusaders, beating drums through the night to keep them awake, yelling that God is great, and lighting grass fires to blanket the encampment in smoke. Me That's, uh, I do know that part. The God is great thing, uh, uh, Allahu Akbar, which is something that Americans have, since 9-11, uh, definitely, uh, misinterpreted many a time, but it, it's basically, like, God is great because uh, it's something that was associated with suicide bombers who would yell Allahu Akbar and then boom. Uh, it, it's kind of this. Uh... Yeah, because like you're dying for like a holy cause, or, you know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but I remember in uh, the uh, <laughs> I, I learned the actual translation when watching Helsing Ultimate Abridged which is like a parody series of the Helsing anime. And they had a scene where it was like, uh, the character is like, God is great. And there are a bunch of Catholic suicide bombers. They're like, God is great. And he's like, it, it, is it racist to say that sounds better in Arabic? Which I don't think it's racist. I think it generally sounds better to hear things in a, in a, a foreign language because it sounds uh, more, uh, I, I guess it's got a mystique to it yelling that God is great, and lighting grass fires to blanket the encampment in smoke. Meanwhile, Saladin has a supply chain of camels bringing his forces fresh water, and in an extra twist of the knife, they take skins of it up to the Crusader lines and dump it out in front of the exhausted, parched men. The next morning, exhausted and choked by smoke, the Crusaders make a desperate drive toward the springs at the village of Hattin. Again and again, the demoralized crusaders smash against Saladin's infantry, pierced by an unending rain of arrows. At this point, Raymond, who had not wanted this plan in the first place, gives up and manages to break his forces through and flee to Lake Tiberias where he can withdraw. 
Saladin lets him go. He wants King Gi. He wants Jerusalem. And with Raymond's forces gone, this fight is unwinnable for the Crusaders. The sun beats down. Knights stumble into the Muslim lines, unarmed, begging to be killed. But Guy makes one last gamble. He withdraws his forces to a <laughs> ruined Iron Age hill fort on a high plain. Two low hills, the Horns of Hattin, guard the approach. And when Saladin's army begins to press him, oh. he calls on God and the True Cross for aid and orders a charge. If he oh. can kill Saladin, he reasons, the Muslims will break. The assault takes Saladin off guard, directing his troops, his son by his side. Hey, it's the first episode. Um, He's going after the guy that the series is named after. What do you think the chances are that this succeeds? I, I, I think they stand a chance. He suddenly sees the Christians surging toward him in a downhill charge. The desperate attack buckles his infantry line, driving his front ranks back, so the combat swirls mere feet from him. But Saladin advances, yelling encouragement to his troops. They throw the Christians back, only for the enemy to rally once more and crash the front line again. The combat nearly reaching Saladin, who by this point realized that he was the objective. But his lines hold, and the Crusaders are sent scrambling back uphill. His son says it's over. But Saladin says it will not be over until the king's opulent tent falls. But He's as he says this, he sees the canvas that. topple in the distance. Oh. The sultan dismounts and prostrates himself in prayer. God has given victory. Saladin has just annihilated the military power of the crusader states, captured the king of Jerusalem, oh, taken it's a their baby. most holy relic, What's the baby and now doing? the city of Jerusalem lies nearly undefended. The baby's reading. Did Hi. Lobus Kyle Mer Dude, what up? Wait, what? Legendary patrons? Thanks, everyone. Oh. Let's see what we the got horns of Siege of Jerusalem. July 4th, 1187. They're going for everything. The battle is over. Bodies lie across the slopes, dismembered and baking in the sun. There are thousands of captives, but Saladin has asked for two of them by name. Guy de Lusignan, King of Jerusalem, and Reynold of Chatillon. When they come, Saladin's palatial tent is still being set up. Saladin then offers Guy a glass of iced julep, and the king, dying of thirst, sucks it down. It's it a relief in more ways than one. It? He knows that in Muslim culture, to offer someone sustenance is a promise they will not be harmed. Guy okay, that, that that's actually that's a nice little un understanding of Saladin's culture that I can appreciate. Uh, I, I was thinking, uh, oh, he's he's offering him something. He's he's gonna poison him. Uh, but I, I'm hoping that that's not the case because that would be too easy. He then hands the cup to Reynold, but Saladin interrupts. He had given the cup to Guy, not Reynold. The Sultan stands, berating Reynold for his blasphemy and treachery, for breaking the peace between Saladin and the Crusader states by attacking pilgrim caravans, for blaspheming God. You are a man without honor. Muslims. He then gives Reynold a choice, convert or die. Reynold refuses, and with one stroke, Saladin strikes off his head. And upon seeing how the king now shakes, the sultan leans in and assures Guy no harm will come to him. Kings, he says, do not kill kings. That's so weird, but interesting. The Battle of Hattin is often listed among the most pivotal military victories in world history. This is because Saladin had done much more than engage and defeat the armies of the Crusader states. He had utterly destroyed them. He had broken the military power of the Latin kingdoms to the point that they could garrison castles but had no field army. He'd captured the True Cross, the most holy relic of the Crusader states, dealing a severe blow to the kingdom's morale and spurning a minor crisis of faith. And finally, he had taken hostage the King of Jerusalem, the Grand Master of the Knights Templar, and so many high-ranking nobles that once the captives' families ransomed them back, their financial ability to wage war was diminished. The lower-ranking captives, those without a noble family to bail them out, were largely sold into slavery, flooding the Damascus markets to the point that a Christian slave could be had for only three dinars. Knights of the Military Orders, the Knights Templar, he should have respected Saladin's customs. Yeah, maybe he could have survived a little longer if he did. But, like, if you are uh, participating in a holy war, to convert at the feet of your enemy, you're converting to a religion you don't believe in, first of all. So that would be... Uh, 
it it that that would in itself be kind of a sin from your own perspective so from for a lot of people i'm sure it would be better to die uh doing the right thing in their eyes than to convert because this isn't just uh your life we're talking about this is eternity that's at stake so i kind of respect him not buckling under the threat of conversion as far as the uh the giving of the uh the nice little beverage to him like i that might have just been a misunderstanding uh, unfortunately <laughs> a very unfortunate misunderstanding and Hospitaller, who were too dangerous to let live and useless as captives because they refused to be ransomed, were executed clumsily by clerics a few days after the battle. Only those Dude, few who up. did convert to Islam were spared. It was a monumental victory. But to make it count, Saladin knew he had to capitalize on it quickly. See, much like the Christian force that they had just defeated, Saladin's army was a coalition of semi-rivals. For over a decade, Saladin had essentially struck a bargain with the leaders of the Muslim Middle East. Unite under the leadership of Saladin, accept the primacy of the Ayyubid dynasty, and he would defeat and conquer the Crusader states. And while this victory Hell had yeah. shut the doubters up temporarily, he still needed to take a big prize in order to make that bargain seem fully worthwhile. And there was really only one objective that would truly vindicate him. Jerusalem. Granted, it wasn't the most strategically important target. That would be Tyre with- There's an episode six? I only have five in this playlist. <laughs> I might have to look for it after this because I I, uh, I didn't realize there was an episode six. Its defensive walls and positions on the Silk Road, but Jerusalem was symbolically crucial. Considered the second holiest city in Islam, Jerusalem contained the Dome of the Rock, the site where the Prophet Muhammad was said to have ascended to heaven, standing I've on the seen rock that. where Abraham had prepared to sacrifice his son to God. Across from it was the Al-Aqsa Mosque, where the Prophet had led prayers. And both were on the Temple Mount, a site also sacred to Jews and Christians. But when the First Crusade took Jerusalem in 1099, they'd turned the Dome of the Rock into a Christian church, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque into a palace, and later headquarters for the Knights Templar. By Islamic standards, this had spiritually polluted both sites, particularly yeah. the Dome of the Rock, since the alterations had included religious art depicting human figures, which are forbidden in Islam. But if Saladin could reverse what the Muslim world looked on as an 88-year occupation, it would legitimize his campaign. And Jerusalem lay nearly undefended, with Guy having thrown everything into Hattin. Saladin swept into Christian-held Palestine, taking city after city. Knowing that his forces might splinter if defeated, or even pinned down in a siege, he kept the speed of the advance up by offering the Christian Oops, cities generous terms <laughs> if they go. surrendered without a fight. All Christians had the option to stay, their properties unmolested, provided they agreed to pay a tax. And those that wanted to leave That's would have 40 days to settle their affairs the time, and would imagine. not be attacked as they made their way to Tyre. When the cities agreed, and most did, he ensured the agreements were honored. That summer, Saladin captured most cities in the Latin Kingdom, save Tyre, and arrived outside Jerusalem in late September with an army of 20,000, where they found themselves facing a pitiful defense force. The Christian leader was Balian of Ibelin, a crusader noble who escaped Hattin and made it to Tyre with 3,000 men, the only noble to escape with his troops. Separated from his wife and children in Jerusalem, which everyone knew was headed for a siege, he'd brokered a safe passage agreement with Sal- It's technically episode six called Crusader State's Craziness. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna have to track that one down and, uh... We'll check it out at the end of this because I that that wasn't even on that wasn't on the schedule. I didn't realize there there was an uh, another one. I thought this was a five episode series. We're gonna do it though. We're gonna make sure we get them all done. Aladdin that allowed him to pick up his family and escort them through the Muslim lines to his home city of Tripoli. But to get that sweet deal, he'd sworn an oath not to fight Saladin or stay in Jerusalem for longer oh. than a day. But when Balian and his 16 knights arrived in the holy city, the patriarch of Jerusalem declared him absolved of the oath and charged him with the city's defense. He accepted, even though it would mean murdering his family. Balian oh. then sent a message to Saladin, informing him that he would be staying in Jerusalem. Saladin's reaction? He sent soldiers to escort Balian's family to safety in Tripoli, the kind of merciful act Saladin would later become famous for. But with no knights in the city but his escort, Balian hastily knighted 60 squires and scratched together a few thousand in a defense force. Tradesmen carried spears, women manned the wall defenses, 
and on September 20th, Saladin attacked the Tower of Danger in the Damascus Gate, bunch. sending clouds of arrows into the fortifications. Again and again, they assaulted the walls with siege towers, but the defenders pushed them back, sallying out to harass the attackers. So, Saladin changed tactics, attacking the city from the east with his host of siege artillery and Greek fire. Engineers tunneled under the defensive wall, collapsing a breach that his army took by assault. Inside, Christians carried out desperate acts of penance in hopes God would save them. They cut their hair, chanted prayers while walking the city barefoot, and Balian came to Saladin to negotiate a surrender. Though Saladin was not in the mood. He was He's generous a... to cities that capitulated without a fight, but by the customs of medieval warfare, a city that resisted got sacked. Heck, the Crusaders had done as much when they took Jerusalem, slaughtered and he probably feels personally betrayed a little bit. So there, there, there's a personal element there. But also, he doesn't... He seems like he's very mature in his handling of a lot of this stuff. Uh, he, he is uh, sort of a slave to tradition, which I, I think make his actions a bit more... Uh, it, it it's kind of like above the individual, which make them a little bit more respectable that he's not letting his own emotions get in the way in a lot of cases, uh, and kind of absolves him in from po some potential perspectives of, uh, of guilt for his actions. Because if he follows, uh, traditional understanding of how these things go, it's just like, Oh, he's just doing what he's supposed to do in a situation like that. Uh, then next thing I know, he ends up turning super uh, bitter and ends up doing terrible things. I, I, I don't know. Uttering the Muslim we'll inhabitants. So Saladin stated he would kill the defenders and sell anyone left into slavery. Oh, to which Balian made bad. a counter threat. Breach the city and they would not only slaughter the city's Muslim population, but destroy every mosque and shrine. Saladin took a moment and met with his captains, weighing the risk of damage against the possibility of looking weak to his allies. He decided to make the deal. The final negotiation centered around ransoms, with the Crusaders coming up with enough money to pay ransoms for 7,000 of their citizens, with the 15,000 they could not afford sold into slavery. However, Dude. Saladin was able to free 3,000 Muslims previously kept by the Crusaders as slaves, and in the spirit of celebration, he released nearly 1,000 Christian prisoners of war. The holy city was handed over without a bloody sack. Well, this isn't a happy ending. What about all the slavery? <laughs> this, is, this is supposed to feel like, oh yeah, things went well. It doesn't feel like it went well. Muslim clerics stripped the Maybe images better than out it of the dome gone. of the rock and purified the temple mount with incense and rose water. Saladin then handpicked the cleric to give the first sermon there, a man who called the recovery of Jerusalem after 88 years a gift from God, comparing Saladin's achievement to that of the prophet Muhammad himself. His victory was complete, casting Saladin as both a victorious general and a man of integrity. In taking Jerusalem, he had killed no innocents, treated captive noble women well, and abided by his oaths. Even when advisors pushed him, he refused to attack the ransom Christians headed to Tyre or destroy the mm. Church of the Holy Sepulchre, reportedly built over Christ's tomb. But the backlash was already on its way. The Vatican, October 20th, 1187. The Archbishop of Tyre approaches Pope Urban III. The Pope is surprised to see him so far from the Holy Land. Oh. The Archbishop kisses the Pope's ring and tells him of the disaster of Hattin, of the capture of King Guy, and of the loss of the True Cross. He says Jerusalem is vulnerable. He doesn't oh. know it's already fallen. Pope Urban's face goes red, then purple. His guards think it's rage oh, no. until the Holy Father coughs and grasps at his chest, dead of a heart attack, the last casualty of Hattin. But the word is out across Europe oh, now. Oh, that's terrifying. And nobles, including kings, are volunteering for a third crusade, including one that will prove himself Saladin's greatest foe, Richard the Lionheart. Oh, Richard the Lion, I know that name. Okay, we're getting into, like, some familiar territory. Well, not familiar territory. I couldn't tell you three things about the guy, but, like, that's a popular name. That that's that's somebody of clear importance. City of Acre, September 1189. 
the force of 8,000 Christians stands before the defensive walls, dug in between the port city and the shore. Among them flies the banner of Guy de Lusignan, the dispossessed king of Jerusalem, and until recently, Saladin's captive. Saladin could destroy them now, and perhaps he should. Acre's garrison forces were larger than the besieging army, and Saladin's troops lay in wait. But he oh. had also heard that the army of Frederick Barbarossa, king of the Holy Roman Empire, oh, plans Barbarossa, to march into Syria man. via Turkey so he can't afford to pin himself down or reduce his dwindling forces. Then he sees dots on the horizon. Even though I don't know much about a lot of the names that come up, just having a little bit of familiarity does make it easier to follow. Ships all along the sea, reinforcements from France, Germany, and Italy. He attacks. But the window for an easy victory has been lost. And the struggle for Acre will be one of the bloodiest engagements of Saladin's career and the opening battle of the Third Crusade. Though the capture of Jerusalem... So this is where the Third Crusade actually starts? Like, before it was, like, uh, taking care of, like, the existing Crusaders. But this is, like a new force coming in so this is where it actually would have started this this is kind of rhetorical i'm just gonna let it play out and see what happens but like that's my understanding from how he explained it a second ago was saladin's most triumphant moment it also marked the pinnacle of his power and influence for years he had advocated that the full powers of the islamic world be placed into his hands with leaders setting aside disagreements over religion politics and ethnicity in order to retake jerusalem but now that that objective had been achieved, that unifying sense of jihad began to fracture. Old rivalries and differences reemerged, along with a new concern that Saladin and his Ayyubid dynasty was becoming a bit too powerful. Troops began trickling back to their original rulers, with many never coming back. And just as this Islamic coalition began to splinter, Europe united under a new crusade. In the near century oh, since the First Crusade, support for crusading efforts had ebbed and flowed. European kings might send money, but they only rallied to go to the Holy Land personally during times of obvious crisis. And the disaster at Hattin, the loss of the True Cross, and the capture of Jerusalem was one heck of a big rallying cry. This crusade, however, was different than previous ones. The recruitment message was much more coordinated via the church, the goals more clear. In fact, a new vernacular developed around the effort. While participants in previous efforts had termed themselves pilgrims, now the act of joining was increasingly called taking the cross, a term taking which led the to the modern term crusader. And much of this effort was focused personally on Saladin. Oh, so before they, they didn't call themselves crusaders? That's like a term that came, by, came afterwards? Oh, th that's... okay. I, I didn't recognize that part depicted as unfathomably evil by christian propagandists it he was referred to it wouldn't be the middle ages if something like that wasn't the case huh like that 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 is kind of a thing we use a lot of terms uh that may not have been recognized in the time that we talk about them by preachers as the son of satan and depicted in illuminated manuscripts as one of the seven heads of the dragon of the apocalypse which is metal af if you ask me Plus, kings going on Agreed. crusade instituted a new tax to fund their military efforts, aptly named the Saladin Tithe. But it's important to remember that these European leaders were no more united than Saladin's fragile alliance. In fact, of the three kings who joined the crusade, the only one beginning their quest relatively quickly, Frederick Barbarossa of the Holy Roman Empire, set out on his journey in April of 1189. Whereas Richard I of England and Philip II of France, by contrast, spent several years squabbling first. While Richard took As the one cross does. almost immediately, when he was still a prince, he had to settle some matters before he could leave. Namely, Richard wanted to be king of England, so he allied himself with Philip of France to fight a war against his own father, and he won. As you can imagine, Richard's family politics were a bit bonkers. Anyway, Richard became king while also holding vast territories in France. But that made going on crusade a bit awkward for Richard and Philip. See, Richard's holdings in France were actually more valuable than Philip's and each wanted to usurp the other out to rule all of France. But now, both were rallying oh, crusader France. armies next door to each other, Very meaning fun. they had to agree to set out for Palestine at the exact same time, so neither of them could invade. Dude, R even Richard's crown is better, man. He, like, R Richard's clearly the man here. The other's territory once they were gone. 
So Saladin, who knew taking Jerusalem would mean fending off a crusade, had some time to prepare. But he didn't. In fact, he kinda squandered his momentum. Though, in fairness, his troops were exhausted from years of drawn-out warfare against the Crusader states, and he likely wanted to preserve his fragile alliance by taking easy victories. He swept up small fortresses and cities that he could argue into capitulating without a fight, sometimes even trading high-value captives for them, anything to avoid costly and demoralizing sieges. But this meant that he left the city of Tyre, its defenses swelled by Christian refugees from Jerusalem and other cities, as a center of resistance and an easy place for crusaders to disembark. Another Ooh. major mistake was letting King Guy of Jerusalem go, an act so mind-bogglingly reckless, historians still argue about his motive. He may have simply felt bad for Queen Sibylla, as Saladin always had a soft spot for his rival's families, and he did love to be generous even to the point of recklessness. In fact, his lieutenants actually used to hide money to prevent him from giving it away. <laughs> or perhaps he thought that Guy would create discord. You know, that is a sign of a very strong leader, kind of like understanding how to dish out the goods. Um, of course, there are those who will spend frivolously, but like, if you're spending on the right people and you're dishing out the goods to maintain the right loyalties and stuff like that, it, it's not bad. It's not bad. But like, I, I get having somebody to check you on that. But there's like a strong, as far as like rules of rulers go, which we talked about in the last one, you got to be able to dish out the goods. So Saladin knows something, even if he is a little reckless. Among the other crusaders who were competing to replace him, whatever the reason, he miscalculated. After a noble named Conrad, who had seized and defended Tyre after Hattin, refused Guy entrance into the city, the dispossessed king rallied a small army and put Acre to siege. And then came Saladin's worst mistake, uh, dawdling rather than committing forces to destroy Guy, which drew the Third Crusade to his small army like a magnet. Saladin finally hit the Christian camp on October 4th of 1189, but by then, it was too late to be easy. The combined forces of the Crusader kingdoms and the foreign reinforcements numbered 30,000, and they were in high spirits. Crossbowmen savaged the Muslim front ranks, followed by a charge of men-at-arms and heavy knights. Saladin's right wing, his weakest troops, broke, and the Crusader forces stormed all the way into Saladin's camp. But there, the Crusaders broke ranks to plunder, as they seemed to always kind of do. Then Saladin hit them with force, sending them fleeing from the slaughter. Other Christians, seeing their companions routed, believed the battle lost and broke, only to then find themselves attacked by Akra's garrison that sallied out to join the battle. Then Saladin mm. sent the enemy corpses down the river so they'd float through the Crusader camp. Oh, it that's victory, terrifying. But barely. Several of Saladin's commanders had lost their fortunes due to the Christian plundering, and the near defeat wrecked morale. He had mm. not relieved Akra, and Saladin could not commit his whole military force to dislodging them for Frederick Barbarossa would invade Syria within months. So Saladin entered the thing he desperately wanted to avoid, the grind of endless siege warfare. And oh, with both sides no. controlling portions of the port, they could both end- You know, it's sieging means like, it means this is, it means the series is gonna slow down for a minute. As warfare slows down, here we get again to sieging. Endlessly reinforced by sea, the result of which was a double siege. The Christians dug in, besieging Acre, and Saladin dug in to besiege the Christian besiegers. <laughs> a turducken of siege, hilarious. if you will. Harassing fire from catapults peppered Acre's defenders. Crusader barges with tall siege engines rode into port as floating artillery platforms, until Saladin's own siege engines burned them down with pots of incendiary Greek fire. Both sides captured men and tortured them within view of the enemy, and the besiegers used anything, including human bodies, to fill in the defensive trenches before Acre. Whatever was thrown in, the Muslim defenders had to pull out. When the Christians did breach the wall, the garrison would sally out to fight the besiegers, while engineers in the city hastily repaired the damage. Saladin's only stroke of luck came in June of 1190, when he received word that Frederick Barbarossa had been thrown from his horse while crossing a river in Anatolia, and the German king drowned in his heavy armor, leaving his contingent oh leaderless God. and wrecked with disease. And while a few managed to arrive at Acre, they did- Like, sometimes there's people who you think are gonna play such a huge role, and then it's just like that. It, it, it's like we're getting back to, uh... Like, this happened a lot in, uh... 
that oversimplified video on the three kingdoms. Every time I thought somebody was important, they were just they were just gone in the stupidest way. You want people to go out and like a climax, a seat, uh, uh, some some sort of like a siege and like a blaze of glory, and they they get taken down on the battlefield. That's like the lamest way to go down. So just in time to suffer through one of the worst winters Palestine had seen in decades. Their food's so short, the you crusaders eat pack animals and possibly even human corpses. I'm kidding. And then, 18 months into the siege, Richard and Philip arrived and things changed. Because they brought with them enormous catapults named... Wait, no, really? <clears throat> named Bad Neighbor and God's Own Catapult. Oh, I'm loving this. That's hilarious. So expensive were they to maintain. Wait, was the first bad neighbor? <clears throat> named bad neighbor. Bad and neighbor. God's own catapult. That's oh, I'm loving this. wonderful. So expensive were they to maintain that a priest had to stand by them during their operation, praying and asking for donations to pay for repairs when they broke down or were damaged. An equally large Muslim catapult dubbed bad relative returned fire. This was a new type of siege Is this a joke? The previous catapults could do no more than harass and injure defenders, but these named beasts knocked great holes in the defensive walls. It was clear Akre would fall. Yet something else appeared in Saladin's camp. A diplomat secretly sent by Richard without Philip's knowledge. Richard, ill with scurvy and calling on codes of chivalric honor, asked for a gift of fruit and ice, and he suggested they meet for talks. Saladin, ever hospitable to enemies, sent awesome. the requested peaches, dates, figs, and ice, along with a message. No meeting, not until they had a peaceful truce. For if the kings met as friends, then later fought, it would bring dishonor on both of them. And fight they would, in a battle that would stand as one of the greatest personal rivalries in all of history. And we'll tell Sounds you about awesome. that little spat next time. So we're on episode three. We're about to go into episode four. So we're going to be doing kind of like the, the semi-final thing. And five is like the final. But then there's like a sixth thing that is like kind of an extension of this. Okay. So in a way, we are halfway done. <laughs> we're going to be strap in, everybody. This is a this is a journey. I think today's stream is going to be slightly longer than uh, four hours for me to get all the things I want done done uh that's seriously what the names translated to for the catapults i don't know did did these names sound better in their original languages they might have sound better in their original languages uh well well the bad or wait not bad neighbor bad relative that would have been in an, another i don't know if the others were even translated but like the the first one that the 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 not the first one the last one the bad relative one I I guarantee that sounded better in its original language. Outside Acre, August twentieth, eleven ninety one, an aide calls Saladin out of his tent. The Crusaders, it seems, are making some kind of move. In the months since Acre's surrender, Saladin and Richard have been mired in negotiations. Saladin has agreed to pay 200,000 dinars, return the true cross, and release captives in exchange for Richard releasing the 2,600 men of Acre's garrison. But these talks have drawn out as Saladin scrapes up the money and seeks assurances that Richard will release prisoners of rank. And when the deadline for the full payment arrived, Saladin could only offer 100,000 dinars oh, for half of the prisoners. he's being cheeky. Richard said no, and now his troops are on the move. Clearly, this troop deployment is some new negotiating tactic. Then, Saladin sees the tied-up prisoners at the center of the Crusader army. That doesn't make any... no. Swords flash and spears strike, and in an industrial display of brutality, Saladin's army watches as Richard's men butcher every last Muslim captive. The fight for Jerusalem Jeez. has begun. This is serious. After the siege of Acre, Saladin's position was more precarious than ever. He had poured enormous amounts of both blood and treasure into its defense. And now, in addition to the humiliation of the loss, he had to shoulder the shame of being unable to save his captured men. His only recourse being to execute Crusader Cap. So he wasn't just holding out on them. Like, he, he wasn't just like, 
I'm just gonna bring less money just because, and we'll we'll see if uh, they're feeling generous that day. He like genuinely couldn't muster up the money, I'd assume. Captives in retaliation. His army was exhausted and dispirited. Crucial support from the sultans and caliphs were drying up, and his Egyptian fleet, berthed in the harbor, had been captured. Worse than all of that, during the siege of Acre, his Ayyubid power structure, the family members he'd placed in high positions, Ayyubid. failed to deliver. Key relations had held back reinforcements and resources, looking after their own domains rather than aiding their sultan. The truth was, Acre revealed the limitations and weaknesses of Saladin's leadership. True, he was a charismatic commander who was excellent at inspiring troops and rallying disparate camps behind a single message. And no one could doubt that his magnanimous generosity, spotting talented soldiers and administrators, then rewarding them handsomely to gain support, was politically astute. But more than anything, he was lucky. Nur ad had died, just as he and Saladin were about to come to blows. Guy had neglected to leave a garrison at Jerusalem when he marched to Hattin, and Frederick Barbarossa drowned in a river. This luck tended to look sorry, a lot like divine sorry, favor, that's supporting just, Saladin's claim to be God's instrument. But it was becoming increasingly clear that Saladin, despite his many talents, was not a great general. And with this series of losses, the flip side of his best qualities were coming out. His extreme generosity now looked foolish, having left the army financially vulnerable. His charisma and can- Oh yeah, that did come back around. Because he was financially reckless, he wouldn't have had the money. Like, he could have had the money if he- Pinched his pennies a little bit more. Okay. Of rallying. E everything comes together. Just there's so much that I kind of forget some details. But now that they've pointed that out, that actually makes total sense why they planted that seed early on. Now it makes sense why he wouldn't have had what he needed when it came time to protect his people. Support by sponsoring schools and preachers to carry his message now just looked a lot like dragging allies into a costly conflict. And with his luck seemingly deserting him, people began questioning whether God still favored him. So what did Saladin do? He turned to his best weapon, letters. He and his scribes drafted correspondence to all of his allies, emphasizing that if they did not send aid, Jerusalem might be lost. Despite Saladin's loss of face, the crisis of losing Acre and potentially Jerusalem regalvanized his patrons in Baghdad and allies whose support had wavered, which was good for him, because Richard was now in sole command of the crusade and he was ready to move. After the Crusaders' victory at Acre, several nobles declared their part of the Third Crusade done and went home. This included Philip II of France, who, having seen the Count of Flanders die during the siege, decided to return in order to settle the succession. Richard was now the only king in the army and able to minimize some of the political infighting. For instance, who would be king of Jerusalem? Conrad, who held Tyre, or Guy? Well, Guy was Richard's Giddy. relative, so that kind of solved that. But more important was Richard's monopolization of military strategy. And unlike Saladin, there was no question of Richard's abilities as a general. Richard marched south, but... Kind of like George Washington, great and inspiring leader, not the best general, though. Yeah, that is a common uh, issue that is... Uh... <laughs> is talked about when it comes to George Washington, that generally, as a uh, military leader, he was not necessarily the best. There were many people who were better than him. Like, if we were talking about some of the better military tacticians, I would have much preferred, like, Nathaniel General Nathaniel Green to lead the United States during the American Revolution. However, George Washington had kind of a leadership quality that goes beyond that. Um, he had a certain degree of humility that allowed him to uh, be talked down from some of his dumber decisions. He's uh, like trying to focus on New York when you should be focusing on uh, Yorktown uh, and, you know, that ended up, uh, him being willing to change his mind, ended up making a huge difference in that conflict. So you don't necessarily need to be the best general to be the best leader. It takes a certain degree of uh, good judgment that goes beyond just how you move troops around, you know. They, they, there's like a different standard that you would hold somebody at that level to. Uh, while you have uh, certain generals who 
really thrive in the field, like Nathaniel Green, who is one of the great uh, underappreciated generals in uh, the American Revolution. So I, I'm sure there are parallels to be made. I'm just comparing it to something that I know. And uh, Shade Cynical had a good point there, so we had to go on that tangent. Not an ill-considered march like the one that had doomed the Christian army at Hattin. Rather, a steady, disciplined move along the coast, supported and supplied by a fleet of ships. As before, Saladin harried his force with archers, trying to slow them as he had at Hattin. But the difference was, Richard had planned for a slow, careful march, never stretching his force out to make it vulnerable. So slowly they marched, with the heavily armored knights from Europe, sometimes having ten arrows sticking from their backs. But, and this march worried sorry. Saladin, because it was clear that Richard intended to take the city of Jaffa, one of the ports serving Jerusalem. And not only would this cut off Saladin's power- Who would win in a fight, uh, uh, in general, Saladin or George Washington? If we're talking about a fist fight, uh, young George Washington might stand a pretty good chance. I don't know how tall Saladin is, but George Washington definitely had some reach to him. <laughs> if we're talking about a fist fight, then, uh, I don't know, George Washington might stand a chance, but it also depends on, like, are we talking about, like, the older George Washington or the young George Washington? Palestinian territories good from question. the sea. I, I, I don't know. Richard could... Good question is as in, like, funny question. <laughs> uh, I don't know if anybody's ever considered, like, a fist fight between the two. <laughs> So I guess it's it's a unique question. Then strike one of two targets, both vital to the Sultan. The first and most obvious was Jerusalem, the holy city. But the second, the city of Ascalon, was the gateway between the Ayyubid territories of Syria and Egypt. A terrifying prospect, since Egyptian wealth funded most of Saladin's armies. He had to strike. Arsuf Wood, September 7th, 1191. Saladin's forces come out of the forest, banging kettle drums, blowing trumpets, and banging gongs. Almost entirely mounted, their light crossbowmen fire, then part for oh, the cavalry to come cool. through and unleash their own rain of arrows. Then, when gaps open in the Crusader line, they surge forward with swords and maces until they're beaten back. The Crusader vanguard has already reached Jaffa, and Saladin hopes to stretch the army out by goading units into a counterattack, then surrounding and destroying them. He goes to the battle line personally, urging his troops on. But the Knights Hospitallar have had enough. Against orders, they unexpectedly charge Saladin's troops, catching many of oh, his no. archers dismounted. And after a hesitation, the rest of the Crusader army follows in the attack. King you Richard gotta go himself now. is seen, fighting in the thick of combat. It's a rout. Saladin's army flees, deeply dishonored, and the Christians take Jaffa, and thus the sea. Saladin's response is scorched earth. Knowing he has to choose between the Holy City and Ascalon, he makes the only real choice. He destroys Ascalon's defenses, as well as those of every fortress and captured Crusader castle between Jaffa and Jerusalem. Then he mounts an intelligence campaign, sending spies into the Crusader camp and tasking Bedouin tribesmen with kidnapping and interrogating Crusader prisoners. And he also opens secret negotiations, because Richard once again wanted to talk, though this time it was a little different. So I mean, Saladin sent his can, most dependable man. brother, Aladil, to handle the diplomacy and the spying which went along with it. Aladil had been Saladin's partner in conquest for a long while, managing the wealth of Egypt so it could be funneled to military pursuits. But he was also a charming figure, an excellent sportsman and hunter, and an embodiment of the developing European idea of chivalry. Richard took a liking to him immediately. And with these negotiations, the Crusader's image of Saladin as the son of Satan began to dissipate, replaced by the image of a fair and noble opponent. Moral of the story, get to know your neighbors before you decide to go to war with them. In fact, that Richard took fair. such what a liking. That? Get to know your Hatfield McCoy. Oh god, what is that? Oh, that's so familiar. What why am I uh Hatfield McCoy? Hatfield McCoy. That's a reference to something. Hold on. I think so. Hatfield and McCoy. Hatfield McCoy feud, uh, described by journalists as Hatfield McCoy war involved two rural American families of the West Virginia, Kentucky area along the Tug Fort and the Big Sandy River in uh, years 1863 to 1891. Okay, 
1863 to 1891. Okay, yeah, I I thought that was familiar. Sorry, I just had to uh, look that one up because that's uh, that's an interesting reference for me to like. I I knew that was something. There we go. Your neighbors before you decide to go to war with them. In fact, Richard took such a liking to Aladil that he proposed a secret plan to marry Aladil to his sister. Oh, you heard that right. Richard wanted to make Aladil his brother-in-law and install the couple as king and queen of Jerusalem. Muslim troops would hold the city and Christian troops the towns outside. Saladin seriously considered this, even though he knew it might have been a ploy to try to separate the brothers by appealing to greed. But then Richard mm. insisted that Aladil would have to convert to Christianity, so it was a hard pass. With negotiations now breaking down, Richard opted to march to Ascalon and on to Jerusalem because Saladin's army was falling apart. The crises had mounted for Saladin. His leaders were restless and his empire in need of maintenance. His method of stalling the crusade by keeping an army in the field, threatening their forces for years on end, had taken a major toll on all of his men. So, on December 12th, his commanders forced him to disband the army, and Saladin mm -hmm. had to take what remained of his personal troops and fortify Jerusalem against the imminent attack. The defenders were so dispirited, there was question whether any would stand. Richard, seeing victory within his reach, <laughs> marched for Jerusalem. The peasants in his army, though beaten down by the unusually harsh winter weather and eaten by lice and camp disease, were still kind of in a religious ecstasy. Some had traveled and fought for years to achieve this goal. And now, they were finally here, and they would take the holy city from the hated Saladin. But after they took it, Richard couldn't help but wonder, what then? There what would then? be a counterattack, and they might not be able to hold the city. Not to mention his supply lines were stretched too long for a siege if it came to that. Whew, Go home, declare Richard. victory. Despite Saladin's defeats, he had slowed Richard just enough that attacking Jerusalem now was too dangerous. So 12 miles from Jerusalem, he ordered his army to go back to Ascalon for the winter. Now this was the right decision militarily, but it most assuredly broke the Crusaders' morale, especially when mm. it leaked that Richard had been secretly negotiating with Saladin, so dissent grew oh, in that's the Crusader gonna... ranks. Yeah, in that's gonna months, hurt. Saladin had lost most of the cities he'd won after Hattin, but he still held Jerusalem. And that's when it yeah, hit the him. One place he that mattered. To beat Richard, all he had to do was outlast Giddy. him. Most okay, so we're almost there. So this next part, we got part five, which is the last part of like the main thing, but then the next part we watch, which is like the informal part six. Uh, I'm told is supposed to kind of like lay out the Crusaders states, which that should be interessant. <laughs> okay, this one's called a Crusades end, so it feels like an appropriate like end, but then we get like our bonus episode, which, you know, that's fun. That is fun. Jerusalem, July 3rd, 1192. It's one of the darkest nights of Saladin's life. Last winter, with his forces in disarray after the defeat at Arsuf, Saladin thought he'd lose Jerusalem. But Richard's army had turned back when they were within sights of the holy city, the English king worrying that the cold weather and his fragile supply lines would not withstand a siege. Now Richard is back, only 12 miles away, and the sultan knows he cannot defend Jerusalem. Days ago, his emirs had pledged loyalty to his face, but he's heard that in private, they're discussing whether to abandon him and tensions between his Turkish and Kurdish contingents are heading towards violence. So he spends mm. a night walking in the city, accompanied by his biographer, and he prays one more time at the Al-Aqsa Mosque, tears falling onto his prayer rug. And the next morning, Saladin announces that they will abandon the holy city. Dude! Oh! He has nothing! He is now the loser. <laughs> no, um, he, he's, uh, that is just probably just emasculating. Just having to make that decision. Like, this is, this is the holy land. This is the thing. Of, and it's like, this is what causes people to really doubt whether God's really on your side. This is something he would not do unless he absolutely had to. Oh my God, that's huge. In July of 1192, it looked all but sure that Saladin would lose Jerusalem, even though he'd done all he could to keep it. 
After Richard and his army had turned back from their winter attack in 1191, Saladin then changed tactics. Because the Muslim army wasn't going to be able to defeat Richard on the field in a conventional stand-up battle, due to the coalition being too fragile and Saladin's men being too exhausted. So rather than outright fight the Crusaders, Saladin had decided to outlast them. Richard was operating far from home, and though he insisted that he would not return until he'd retaken Jerusalem, Saladin knew that was easier said than done. In fact, he knew that all too well. The Ayyubid Empire had deteriorated during his years managing the Jihad, and compared to Richard, he was practically next door to his home territories. Howdy, Plus, neighborino. Everyone knew Philip II of France was interested in acquiring the Lionheart's French possessions, meaning Richard was always nervously glancing back towards Europe. So in the spring of 1192, Saladin stuck it out, attacking the Crusader supply lines and using diplomacy to exploit fractures in the Crusader's leadership. For instance, he entered in secret negotiations with Conrad, the man holding Tyre, who was in a dispute with Guy de Lusignan over the throne of Jerusalem that was such a bizarre knot of kidnapping and murder. We're actually going to do a whole postscript episode on it all next week, and it's going to be cool. a doozy. But for now, all you need to know is that Saladin did his best to exploit those divisions and keep Richard occupied. For the record, Richard eventually just put his nephew on the throne anyway before making his second attempt at capturing Jerusalem. So on the eve of the attack, Richard's coalition already had some fault lines, and that was before he got the reports that his brother Prince John was secretly plotting to take over the throne of England. Yeah, he needed to wrap things up quickly and return home. Which brings us right back to where we started off. Saladin despondent, convinced he's about to lose Jerusalem. Yet that's when Richard made Dude. a mistake that doomed his second expedition. Now we talked a lot last episode. Oh, so sad. Man's not gonna be able to control nearly as much of the world as he controls. He he must be broken. Oh no. Sometimes I feel sometimes I feel bad for people in power, but then I real I come back down to earth and I'm just like these guys have like everything. They're playing with so many people's lives. I sh I shouldn't always feel too bad for any leader at this level. Like the the they've probably done enough bad stuff that I have no reason to really feel bad for them at all. Like th like episode one, how many people ended up in slavery, or was that episode two? I don't know. About how Richard was a better general than Saladin, but Saladin, you see, he was the better leader. After Hattin, when Saladin had to choose between seizing the strategically important Tyre or the religiously important Jerusalem, That's he chose decision. Jerusalem because he knew that if he turned away from the holy city, his troops would consider it a betrayal. But Richard, ever the good soldier, concluded that it made better military sense for this new attack to be directed toward Egypt. He would strike Saladin's most profitable province and then force the sultan to hand over Jerusalem via negotiation. Looked great on paper. Dude. The only problem was, Richard forgot he was fighting a crusade, not a war. His announcement that they would, for a second time, turn back from Jerusalem, fatally damaged morale. Worse, he let the army get within sight of Jerusalem before changing the target to Egypt. His war council Aww. split into factions. Both nobles and common people, who'd endured years of travel, hardship, and personal suffering in order to take Jerusalem, insisted on making the attack. Richard, believing it wasn't feasible and worrying for his reputation if they lost, threatened to resign as leader. So the crusade fractured, its leaders unable to agree on a strategy. You don't have to go to back home, him. I guess. Saladin, seeing this and thanking God for the return of his incredible luck, decided to strike back at Jaffa. Saladin's forces hit the city in late July, hoping to overwhelm it and strand Richard in Ascalon. They took the outer defenses quickly, but then Saladin lost control of them. His army, still furious over the massacre at Okre, began to execute captured Christians. Horrified, Saladin managed to evacuate some of the defeated Christians into the city's citadel, which still held out before reimposing discipline. A week later, they'd nearly taken that citadel when Saladin heard shouts and turned to see ships pulling close to shore. Oh, no. A strike force of knights jumped into the shallows and began running in a charge, Richard at their head. Attacked from behind, the Muslim Richard's army kind of fled, a beast. Though not before Saladin. So at first, I was I really appreciate Sal Saladin as a leader, and I, I kind of like that he draws the distinction of being a leader versus being a general. Um, I kind of like how much 
Richard is kind of separated from the symbolism of things and can kind of see clearly through that. Of course, there are some flaws in that, but it kind of makes me uh, sympathize with him a little bit more because I, I would I would want somebody to approach things a little bit more like Richard, even though I really appreciate what Saladin's doing. I, I see Richard's plan and I'm like, yeah, that makes all the sense in the world. Go to Egypt. Uh, but I also see how not every people aren't robots you can't just program them to think like you or uh to let go of the symbolism uh it it means a whole lot to them this is still a, a holy war it's still real to them damn it Ludden tried to stage a surprise assault but it was spotted and broken yet another loss one which brought Saladin personally to the brink of collapse Throughout his life, Saladin just cry had always the whole suffered episode. bouts of illness. Years of high-stress command duties while also running an empire had taken their toll. But after Jaffa, his exhaustion and digestive issues became particularly severe. Richard, ironically, was also burning with fever, fighting a camp disease. And since their armies were faring no better, fatigued and falling apart, and the Third Crusade locked in a stalemate, Aladil went back to the Crusader camp, and the two forces entered negotiations to end the war. Once again, Aladil worked his magic, displaying his courtly manners and bringing excellent gifts, reminding the Crusaders of Saladin's many good deeds towards Christian women and children, highlighting the Sultan's regular gifts to the poor, and pointing out that Jews, Greek Orthodox, and Coptic Christians lived in Muslim territory without issue. In fact, under Saladin, yeah. Coptic Christians had been invited back to Jerusalem. They'd been expelled by the Crusaders. And through Aladil, the Western view of Saladin began to permanently shift. During previous talks, Richard had come to like Saladin, considering him honorable and chivalrous. But now increasingly, the Crusaders respected his governance and generosity, and would bring stories of this image back to Europe. Likewise, Saladin's camp took a liking to Richard, especially since the king personally cultivated relationships with Saladin's emirs in hopes of undermining the Sultan's power base. He even offered to knight some of them. After months of haggling, oh, they so finally sweet. settled on an agreement. Muslims would hold Jerusalem, but allow unarmed Christian pilgrims to visit, while the Christian states would hold the coastal land they'd taken, with the exception that Richard would return Ascalon to Saladin, but diminish its defenses. And there would be peace between Saladin and the Crusader states for three years. Not something either side considered a total win. In fact, both were disappointed, but not a total loss either. Yeah. And with that, Richard got on a boat and sailed back to Europe. Saladin had indeed outlasted him. Then so I suppose it is still kind of a win for Saladin, though. Uh, when somebody else is the aggressor, all you want to do, well, all you need to do is maintain what you already have. And in a sense, they did lose some stuff, but th the thing that mattered the most is still in their hands. Not as firmly as before, but it's still in their hands. So, it, but... The Crusaders are walking away with some stuff that they didn't have before, I believe. But Saladin took some of the stuff that they that they had initially taken. So I don't know how mathematically this works out. Who's up when it comes to land? Saladin made celebratory tours of forts, exercising his characteristic generosity by giving away the gifts Richard had given him. Even though he'd lost most of what he'd gained after Hattin and had failed to destroy the Crusader states, he was still greeted in Damascus as a hero. Throngs of people came into the street, cheering for the champion of Islam. Happy he could finally turn to domestic and economic matters, Saladin talked about finally making the Hajj to Mecca. But the Sultan's clip. Little late, but can you react to the to a bridge series on here? Uh, I I love them. I love a bridge. Uh, anime stuff, but like I, I don't know if I want to do that. I, it just, I've, I've gone outside of my history bubble on the channel once or twice. Uh, that's something I would definitely do more, like for like channel members. Like occasionally, I go further outside of uh, my bubble where it's like supposed to be a kind of on the educational side. Uh, but there are some things that. I would love to check out it. And if they were in like a members only capacity where like I've kind of opened it up to do different kinds of stuff, I'd think about it. But overall, that's not the direction I'm going for on the channel. You know what I mean? Closest advisors were worried. 
Even as he celebrated, they noticed his chronic fatigue and migraine headaches. Becoming more and more forgetful and easily tired, he declined in the next three months. Then, on March 4, 1193, Saladin died, an imam sitting next to him, reading the Quran. And when his family went to pay his funeral expenses, they found in his personal treasury only one gold coin and 36 silver dinars. He owned no personal estates and had given all he had to the poor. In the end, his family had to borrow money to bury him. Saladin's sons fought to control the Ayyubid dynasty after his death, but it was Al-Adil who would ultimately take charge. And though in the 13th century, the Ayyubid dominance would fall apart piece by piece, for a time, it fostered a peaceful environment for trade and culture in the region. But it That's would be bad. the memory of Saladin, not his achievements, that would ultimately last. Remembered as a chivalrous and honorable opponent in the West, even held up as a model for European monarchs, in the Middle East, he's been cast as everything from a patriotic figure for Egyptians and Kurds to a model for Pan-Arabists and those that see themselves as battling the West. Yet neither of those images are what we see when we look at the real Saladin. We see a complicated man who could be both merciful and ruthless. An inspirational leader who managed to hold on to the greatest victory of his life by the skin of his teeth, and whose greatest strength was not as a military conqueror, but as a negotiator and coalition builder, always willing to approach enemies with respect and broker deals. A rare historical figure that in the end was respected by friends Kitty. and enemies alike. <laughs> I don't want to brag. Okay, hold on. Now I got to... I, I was told about episode six. I was told that it exists. And I'm going to find it wherever. It, oh, there it is. It's like Kingdom carry of up. Jerusalem, 1174. Uh, uh, there we go. Found King it. Almeric lies on his deathbed, trying to decide who will succeed him. And it's not an easy decision. He knows others want the crown, and the Sultan Saladin is a rising threat. He has two daughters. Isabella is from his current wife, Sibylla is from an annulled marriage, but still legitimate, and then there's Baldwin IV, his only son who is 13 and has leprosy. He leaves the crown to Baldwin, and thus begins one of the craziest succession crises in all of history, filled with passion, betrayal, and a musical chairs game of annulled marriages. So get your corkboards, yarn, and pushpins ready, because this one's a doozy. Okay, so this one's called The Next King of Jerusalem. It, it holds an interesting place in the timeline, I suppose. Uh... So I guess it's separate, but very much related. So we're going to definitely see a lot of similar uh, figures or, or like it just, I guess, expand our image of things that we are seeing already. I guess it's a good thing to add to the end of this. Thanks so much to The Great Courses Plus for sponsoring today's episode. To learn Wonderful how you service. can get a free trial and support extra history in the process, stay tuned until after the episode. In our Saladin series, we hinted at the shenanigans surrounding who would become the King of Jerusalem. But because those episodes, which you totally should check out if you haven't already, dun were centered on that. Saladin, we really couldn't fit the full madcap story in there. But today, we're going to tell you all about this little historical slice of madness. After the First Crusade ended in 1099, a collection of mostly Frankish kingdoms formed in Palestine, That's serving cute. as both a political force in the Middle East and a launching point for new crusades. The most Looked powerful of these was there. the Kingdom of Jerusalem. But as of 1174, it's ruled by a leper, which is a bit of a problem, since no matter how brilliant or vigorous Baldwin IV is, he won't live long and will never have children. So he's surrounded by plots for his entire decade-long reign. Enter oh, yeah. Sibylla, Baldwin's sister, who, due to Baldwin's condition, is suddenly the most eligible lady in the Holy Land. And powerful nobles hmm. in the Crusader states want to secure her a marriage that will be advantageous when Baldwin finally kicks it. After all, they're eventually going to need help from Europe to stay uh as far as cases of like monarch like figures or dictators uh who are in a vulnerable position but the sister seems to be the key to power uh you don't see I, i'm sure there are plenty of examples i just can't think of many right now the only the only example i can think of right now is like north korea when people look at like uh kim jong un and uh when he had like a health crisis they were they were looking at his sister but overall uh uh it, it's not always the person that i expect to be the key to power but that that's really interesting dave off saladin 
Enter the Archbishop of Tyre, who sets Sibylla up with a fine young man from France, but who eventually gets cold feet about living in the Middle East and ditches her to go back to Europe. So next, Baldwin arranges a marriage between Sibylla and a guy named William Longsword. I mean, how can you go wrong with a guy whose name is Longsword, am I right? He's tall, blonde, handsome, and good at fighting. So he Heck marries yeah. Sibylla, then promptly dies of malaria. Though Sibylla oh, gets no. pregnant first, giving Baldwin a potential heir. Now, she's the most eligible widow in the Holy Land, and whoever marries Ooh. her will at the very least get to be regent until the boy is old enough to rule in his own right. And the nobles definitely want Sibylla married. And, you know, if you want to slip something into the kid's food, you know, you'd, you'd have access to him. Read <laughs> again as Saladin is becoming ever more threatening. And since Philip II of France is still a minor, their usual ally is in no position to help. Jerusalem needs to secure an alliance with a European state who can send troops if needed. Enter Guy de Lusignan. He's the first cousin to Henry II of England, and that might come in handy for the Crusader states. Namely because Henry sort of, kind of, accidentally murdered Thomas Becket, the Archbishop of Canterbury, long story, and owed the Pope a penance. And these nobles figure that if Guy is married to Sibylla, Henry is more likely to discharge that IOU to the Pope by going on a crusade to help them. So Sibylla and Guy tie the knot, have two daughters, and Baldwin raises Guy to the status of regent, to rule in his stead if he's too sick to do it himself. But then Guy starts hanging out with Reynold of Chatillon, who is basically an aristocratic pirate. Reynold came Hell to the yeah. Holy Land seeking riches. Well, pirates in general... I, I think pirates get like an unofficial rep as like these like anarchists of the sea, but we have plenty of uh, people who have status who take on like pirate tactics. There are pirates that are endorsed by the state. E even uh, even if you watch Pirates of the Caribbean, which is incredibly inaccurate in its de depiction of pirates, I believe that even. Uh, shows some pirates that are kind of in the pocket of the state i i thought maybe i'm thinking of one piece i know one piece does that <laughs> who could mix up pirates of the caribbean in one piece and managed to find it by marriage torturing like the shijibukai i believe the warlords from one piece they're they're like pirates uh endorsed by the state which they still have kind of a uh a rogue nature to them but a, a lot of pirates were endorsed by the state and were kind of pretty much in line with their uh, methods bishops looting allied crusader states and robbing the peasantry but he crosses a line when he starts antagonizing saladin attacking merchant shipping and pilgrim caravans to mecca even after baldwin had signed a treaty with saladin to give the crusader states some breathing room so when Baldwin tells Guy to punish this murder-happy mercenary, Guy kind of feels like he can't, because Reynold argues that the truce is only between Saladin and Baldwin. Baldwin is furious, so he deposes Guy and has Sibylla's son crowned co-king of Jerusalem, passing over Guy entirely. He then puts a clause in his will, stating that if Sibylla's son, Baldwin V, somehow mysteriously dies, the kings of England, France, the Holy Roman Empire, and the Pope will decide who gets to rule Jerusalem next. Then Baldwin promptly kicks the bucket, and his young heir, Baldwin V, who also has leprosy, also dies within a year. After a scramble, Sibylla becomes queen, assuring rival nobles Guy will not be their king. Then, as soon as she's crowned, you guessed it, she goes back on her promise and there makes Guy king, causing another succession crisis. But with Saladin finally on the march, the Crusader states can't afford to bicker. So they put aside their differences and march under Guy, who raises his banner and leads them to total destruction at the Battle of Atene, getting himself captured while Saladin goes on to cut Reynolds' head off and conquer Jerusalem. Then a year later, for reasons that aren't clear, Saladin decides to release Guy. But still intent on reclaiming his kingdom, Guy then shows up to the city of Tyre, one of the remaining strongholds of the Crusader states, and demands that they give it to him because he's the king of Jerusalem. The noble holding the city, a guy named Conrad, who recently arrived from Europe and managed to hold the city against Saladin when no one else could, essentially says, Uh, how exactly are you the king of Jerusalem when Saladin holds Jerusalem? Good Ooh, question, Conrad. This he guy's is cheeky. a king without a kingdom, but he does have an army coalescing around him. So, in an act of desperation, he marches south and besieges the port of Acre. And there, in a stroke of luck, the incoming Third Crusade decides that's where they want to land. 
aid from England, France, and Germany gathers around his banner. But there were two problems for Guy. First, during the siege of Acre, Sibylla and her daughters died of disease, which was bad since oh. it was Sibylla and not Guy who had the claim. Second, Conrad oh, and his supporters yeah, come bad. up with a sneaky plan to make Conrad king of Jerusalem by marrying Sibylla's half-sister Isabella, who now has the best claim. Of course, true to this story, oh. even with that plan, there were more complications. A. Isabella was already happily married. B. Conrad was also married. And C. Isabella had previously been married to Conrad's brother, which by church law made them siblings and any marriage would be incest. Yeah, but you know, you, you just gotta, you gotta get in the good graces of the Pope. He, he can make anything happen. But y'all, Conrad really wanted to be king of Jerusalem, okay? So, his supporters kidnapped Isabella away from her husband, oh get her God. marriage annulled on the basis that she was too young when she was married, and then forcibly marry her to the again already married Conrad, all made possible by a pleasantly bribable archbishop. Archbishop, okay, you didn't even have to go to the Pope for this one. <laughs> but, and this keeps going, remember how the kings of Europe were supposed to appoint Baldwin's successor? Well, Guy's related to Richard I of England, who was the now dead Henry's son, and Conrad is the buddy of Philip I of France, both of whom are now in Acre on crusade and want their say. And what of the Holy Roman Emperor? Well, Brown. he drowned in a yeah. river, so he didn't get a vote. Eventually, they come to a temporary compromise. Guy will be king of Jerusalem, and Conrad will inherit the kingdom after Guy's death. But of course, neither trusts the other, so they both secretly open negotiations with Saladin to better support their individual claims. Because screw holy war, this is about personal power now. Which led to an awkward scene when envoys from Guy's camp and envoys from Conrad's camp accidentally run into each other while both being entertained by Saladin's men. Whoops. Finally trying to solve Awkward. the problem once and for all, the local barons essentially just decide to hold an election for king. And while Richard tries to rig it for Guy, Conrad wins. Richard, deeply annoyed, Suffrage makes the drowning <laughs> as a consolation okay, prize. You so win. it's over now. You win today. Right? Nope. You ready for the lightning round? Here we go. Before Conrad can be crowned, oh, two God. members of the Assassin's Order to stab focus. him to death while he's on his way to dinner with a friend. Richard, who had supported Guy, becomes suspect number one, especially after he gets his nephew, Henry of Champagne, married to Isabella eight days after Conrad's death, which is why on his way home, Richard gets captured by Conrad's allies in Austria, forcing the English crown to bankrupt itself, paying his ransom. Then Isabella's new husband, Henry, accidentally falls out of a window that he might have survived if a servant hadn't landed on him, and she marries oh. again, this time to, surprise twist, Guy's brother, who then dies from eating too much mullet. Okay, that was a lot. Let's take a step back. The Crusades are often discussed as a Christian-Muslim religious conflict. But if there's a lesson to take away from all this, it's that often motivations were more complicated. The Crusaders' leadership... Oh, yeah, easily. Like, it, I don't think anybody is under the impression that this is just a religious conflict. It's a deeply political conflict with religious justifications. <laughs> I think everybody kind of recognizes that that's a thing. People want power. People want money. People want control. It's it's bigger than just a holy war. But having kind of like that holy message behind you, it's a great way of motivating people to fight for you. Uh, and uh, there are plenty of people who are going to be genuine Kool-Aid drinkers there. But let, let's be real. There, this has layers to it was often as worried about money and power, just as much, if not more, as religious goals. And they didn't just want to win back Jerusalem, they each wanted their guy to rule it. Also, maybe monarchy was a bad idea. But you know what's full of good- Okay, hold on a minute. Uh, my, uh, my headphone is, uh, is dying. I'm gonna have to plug that in. Hopefully my other one is good. I only use one at a time. So I can conserve battery, but I th I think we are good on that. That was hella fun, man. I I, I really enjoyed learning about the Third Crusade. Uh, we had so many fun, like interesting figures in this one. I I feel like uh, I didn't like the uh, the people involved in the first one nearly as much. They didn't stand out as much to me as uh, as this one did. Uh, it was that that was really rad. Um, so, I guess while we're here, I may as well 
go and check in on how that poll is doing. Um, doo -doo, let's see who's winning. All right, so it looks like the Haitian... So we got 91 votes. That's cool. Uh, I wonder how many of them have tuned in. Um, so we have the Haitian Revolution, which is at 26% in second place. Uh, Battle of Kursk is not doing well. Um, that's fine. Um, I didn't want to do it immediately anyway, even though it's it was totally one of the few that was like fully my choice. Uh, we got Joan of Arc, 23%. So, you know, there's still a chance for Joan of Arc to beat the Haitian Revolution. We'll give it time. It has all week, basically. We have the first Opium War, which seems to be doing pretty well. It might run away with it. We'll see. And then we got this one. Uh, I think it's Kosro. I, f I forgot how to say it. Or Kosro. I, I, I apologize if my pronunciation is not good. Uh, but yeah, if you want to vote in the poll and you haven't yet, if you want your voice heard, it will determine uh, the, the order. So if we called it right now, I'd be doing the first Opium War. Next week, the week after, I'd be doing the Haitian Revolution, then Joan of Arc, then Khosrow, and then the Battle of Kursk. 